Good morning, everyone. Well, it's going to get out of my face somehow. All right. Happy 2024. Yes, we made it. Okay, so there are these three sons, and they got together to talk about Christmas because they weren't able to gather. And the, one, the first son said, well, I bought Mom a really big house. And the second one said, well, that's fine. I got her a really fancy car. And the third brother was like, you know, mom loves the Bible, and her vision isn't that great. So I bought her a parrot that can read the, recite the Bible to her. So a little bit of time passes, and they all get on a Zoom call, seeing mom for the first time of the year. And mom, and they're like, did you get Mom, did you like your Christmas? And she's like, well, you know, Milton, that house is a little too big for me, so I'm not going to move in. And I have to tell you, Gerald, that car, it's way too small and goes way too fast for me. I think we should trade it in. But I have to say, Donald, your gift was so precious. It was the most delicious chicken I have ever cooked. <laughs> So there we have it, you know, the season of giving never ends. As um, Joan shared with you, we are going back to the first four chapters. And the first four chapters pretty much say the same thing over and over and over. So delightfully, we have three ministers that are going to give you our version and share a little bit about how we got into this teaching. So it's going to be a really fun four weeks. Um, so the chapters are the thing itself, which is God, spirit, Harry, whatever you want to call it. The way it works, which is through us. What it does is say, yes, my beloved. And how do we use it? We use it by consciously thinking. So that's kind of what we're going to cover. And today, I'm going to start with the first chapter, which is the thing itself. Ernest Holmes says, the thing itself is the power of God to create as we think into it. As we think into it. Now, when I first started going to a Science of Mind church, I thought, the thing itself, that is just so disrespectful, right? I mean, it's God after all. I was raised a good Episcopalian, and it's God. It's spirit. It's mother, father, God, whatever, but it's not the thing itself, right? It just felt wrong. But then the more I got to know about this thing itself, the only creative force, the universal power, doesn't play favorites always works the same way. The thing itself became one of my favorite phrases because it reminds me that God is impersonal, totally impersonal. There's no begging, there's no pleading, there's no bargaining, there's no pleasing. And at that point in time, I was like the best people pleaser ever. More on that the fourth Sunday. But I realized that I didn't need to please, beg, or bargain. I just got to be. Because the thing itself loved me as me. And loved me even more, if that's even possible, when I was authentically me. Because then I was loving myself as well. You see, this teaching is based on certain principles, certain laws that never change, that we are all using all of the time. And the purpose of this teaching, this philosophy, is to look at how we're seeing and how we're using it and how we're thinking, and to take us to the top of the mountain for us to expand our vision of who we are and what we are here to be, to so much greater than we have ever thought possible. 
just like anyone who mixes yellow and blue together and you get green. You do get green, right? Yellow and blue. Yeah, you get green. Um, we can prove these principles just by expanding our awareness of who and whose we are. We can prove these principles that are the same for all. And we can share this teaching with all by inspiring and empowering those people who are in our life, be it for a long time or for a moment. Holmes writes in the textbook, the study of science of mind is a study of first cause. Spirit, mind, that invisible essence, that ultimate stuff, and intelligence from which everything comes from, the power, the back of all creation, that is the thing itself. And the one thing I really love about the first, doing the, the first chapter is I get to share one of my favorite Bible stories. Probably my favorite because it's one of the few I know. <laughs> but anyway. Um, <laughs> The thing itself, there's this wonderful story Jesus told about a father who had two sons, the prodigal son. The youngest son comes to his father and says, I want my part, I want my piece of the action because I'm ready to go off and become my own man. This is my version of the story, it's <laughs> my version. But anyway, so he gets his father, doesn't say, doesn't say no, doesn't ask any questions, just says, yes, my beloved son, here you go. And off he goes into the city, meets some new friends, has all of this money, has a great time, until the money runs out. And then he realizes he really didn't meet any new friends, right? Because once the money was gone, they were gone. He finds himself feeding pigs for a living and realizes one day that the pigs are eating better than he is. Not cool. So he decides it's time to suck it up. Go back to his father, confess the sin that he made, right? Beg, beg for forgiveness. And just ask his father if he would hire him. Because his father's workers were living a much better life than he was. And he thought, my dad will at least give me a job, right? So he makes the long trek home. And his father sees them in the distance and starts celebrating, right? They go and they kill a calf and start a party. He runs to his son with sandals and a robe and says to the, asks the servant to bring him a ring for his finger. And he doesn't even get a chance to really say, Father, I have sinned. Please forgive me. He doesn't really get a chance to say that in my version he, because he's like filled with love. And, and they have this wonderful celebration. And to me, this speaks of the essence of the thing itself. Because, like the father in this story, sometimes we all know it's not the right thing to say yes to. But what the thing itself does is says, yes, my beloved. I am with you now, I am with you forever, I am you. It just honors the free will. That's it, just honors the free will. Just like he honored the free will of his son. Holmes writes, the divine plan is one of freedom. Bondage is not God ordained. Freedom is the birthright of every living soul. And it is up to us to discover for ourselves our inherent nature. It is up, up to us to discover the divine within. The divine within. The prodigal son was all about the divine out there, right? It was all about the stuff, the glitter and the glamour and being popular and, and all of that stuff looking out there for the world to fulfill him. And I think we've all done that at one point in time or another. We kind of fall into that trap of stuff, stuff that's gonna make us happy, gadgets and all of those. 
And I'm not saying stuff isn't wonderful, because, you know, it's kind of nice. But what are we really seeking? We're not really seeking more stuff, right? We're seeking a type of fulfillment. We're, think, we're seeking things that are making us feel happiness. We are seeking the freedom to express our true nature, you know, like, this is who I am, this brand new Lexus. It's that. But in order to really have all of that great stuff, to have it and to keep it, including relationships and life in general, we need to be rich inside first. We need to spend some time courting that presence, I believe. Because when we do that, we are expressing our goodness, our happiness, our freedom from the inside out. And that's when it shines so bright. And I have to tell you, the world could use a little bit more brightness right about now. The younger son, well, he lived well on the outside, but only on the outside. Until he got to a place of being humble. Have you ever been really humble in your life? Like really humble to the point where, okay, ego, just leave me alone. This isn't working. <laughs> I've got nowhere else to turn. Like down on your knees, humble. I think we've all been there. And if we haven't, then we need to relook at how we view our history, because I think you will find that we have. A place when we're putting everything, our pride aside, and we're just saying, OK, use me. Help me, use me, direct me, guide me. It is at that point, it is at that point that I believe the thing itself really suits up and shows up surrounded with grace. Allowing us to feel that love and that happiness and that self-acceptance just the way we are. Just the way we are. And allows us to build back up that ability to reach inside for the richness. Kierkegaard called it the God hole, that part of you that is not being fulfilled, that is saying, why am I not happier? Why is this stuff not bringing me joy the way it did? It is because that nine hollowness, that is actually the thing itself calling us home. The thing itself saying, seek within first. Allow me to fill that hole in divine partnership with you. And that is all about turning to the truth, recognizing that we are co-creators of our life, recognizing that the thing itself, the thing itself is experiencing its creation as we are experiencing our life is always in divine partnership and always saying yes. And once we start to do that, and anyone who's been in this teaching for any length of time will confirm this. Once we start seeking to fill that hole within, and we start coming from that place of being the authentic me, the authentic one, when we stop Seeking stuff, stuff starts to appear. When we start to give of our time, more time appears. When we start to give of our love, our relationships become stronger. And sometimes some relationships go away because we're giving love. Mm -hmm. When we give of our treasures to where we're spiritually fed, those treasures come back. Because it's how 
the principle works, the law of cause and effect, that whole circle of life that everyone talks about. That circle of life is for all aspects of life. Just as when we give out of a place of anger, right? What comes back is anger. Ernest Holmes writes, man by thinking can bring into experience whatsoever he desires. If he thinks correctly and becomes a living embodiment of his thoughts, this is not done by holding thoughts, but by knowing the truth. That as we give, we receive, pressed down and multiplied. Which brings me to part two of the story, right? I said two sons. So now here's this elder son back at the ranch. They're having this big party, and this son, the older son, he is just, he's livid because here he's done nothing but serve his father. He's worked hard. He's always been there for him. He's not demanding anything. You know, he's like right there by his side. By his side. And here, his brother is getting all of the glory right now. And what is he getting? Nothing. He's getting nothing. And he is just fit to be tied. So the father comes out to bring him into the party, and he's like, I'm not going in there. I'm not celebrating him. He's like wasted everything. And here I am, right, doing the right thing, day in and day out, right by your side. And he comes home with nothing, and you give him everything. And the father is like, well, my son, you are always with me, and everything I have has always been yours. You see, on the surface, right, we can relate to why he was not very happy, right? I mean, we've all been there, worked really hard, and somebody else got the promotion, worked really hard, and the raise wasn't as much as it should have been, you know, doing what I'm supposed to be doing, but I'm still getting a little shortchanged in life. Well, here's the thing. The older son was surrounded by everything the father had, but he didn't know that. He didn't accept that. He wasn't able to accept that. He didn't have a high enough vision. He wasn't willing to go to the mountaintop. In fact, he didn't even think there was a mountaintop. You know, here he is, maybe wishing he had a loaded, you know, a fully loaded Tesla, and, you know, he's driving around in this bottom basement Prius. I don't know. He just, but he had no vision. He didn't know that all of this was his. He didn't ask. He settled. He allowed that rut in life to be his rut in life. His lot in life was to be of service to his father, not realizing that he created his own lot in life. He needed to go to the mountaintop. He needed to have a vision of what his life was like what he wanted in his world. And I think that's true of a lot of us. We sort of settle. We settle for what we've got. We're for, you know, because, you know, this is who I am, and middle class is what I've got, or lower class, or whatever it is you want to name it, right? I am who I am, and this is what I have. But as in the reading today, if we allow ourselves, to go within and fill that hole, to allow the richness in within to come out. If we take time and shut off the monkey mind who is saying, you know, it is what it is, when we shut that off and we say, heck with that, I'm going up. I'm going out. When we do that, and we let that small voice, which is that essence of who we really are, start to have a voice, it doesn't stay small very long. It gets louder, and it gets louder. And before you know it, things start to turn, and we realize we don't have a lot in life. We have all that is the Father's. Everything that the thing itself creates is all of ours. 
once we're willing to name it, claim it, and accept the fact that we're worthy of it. And that's the trick, to know that you're worthy of it. And the way we get around that trick is we go within. Because within, spirit feeds us and recognizes how rich we truly are. T.S. Eliot wrote, at the end of all of our exploring, we will, we will be, at the end of our exploring, we'll, we will arrive where we started and know that place for the very first time. Isn't that beautiful? All of the searching and all of the seeking we're doing takes us right back to our heart, to our soul, to our connection with that one thing itself. Hafiz puts it this way. My beloved said, my name is not complete without yours. I thought, how could a human's worth ever be such? And God, knowing all of our thoughts, and all of our thoughts are innocent steps on the path, then addressed my heart. God revealed a sublime truth to the world when he sang, I am made whole by your life. Each soul, each soul completes me. We are all one. We are all part of this thing called life. That's it, all of us, whether we know it, believe it, or not. But just imagine how life would be if in our heart of hearts we knew who and whose we are. How would life change if we respected and honored every other traveler on this path, no matter what, no matter what. The thing itself, it says, yes, my beloved. And we are each the beloved in our own divine expression. So this year, I invite us all to lead a spiritual life. I, I invite us all to take time during the day and celebrate who we are. If you have a spiritual practice, great, up it. If you don't, get one. Um, the book that Colleen read from today is a daily read. Um, I've been reading it daily, almost daily, for I don't know how many decades. Um, the science, Living the Science of Mind, great book. Little excerpts of Holmes talking about how we actually live this teaching. Um, there's all kinds of things. A daily spiritual read is just so, so lovely. And I would like to close with a really quick meditation. Okay, And it's on the very last page of this book, Living the Science of Mind. So get comfortable for a minute and just breathe and close your eyes if you want and just settle in. I know there is a power for good which is responding to me and bringing into my experience everything that is necessary to my unfoldment to my happiness, to my peace, to my health, to my success. I know there is a power for good that enables me to help others and to bless the whole world. So I say quietly to myself, there is one life. That life is God. That life is perfect. That life is my life now. It is flowing through me, circulating in me. I am one with its rhythm. My heart beats with the pulsation of the universe. In serenity, in peace and in joy. My whole physical being is animated by the divine spirit and there is anything in it that does not belong anything. 
Anything that does not belong is cast out because there is only one perfect life in me now. And I say to myself, I am daily guided so that I shall know what to do under every circumstance, in every situation. Divine intelligence guides me in love, in joy, and in complete self-expression, desiring that the law of good alone shall control me. I bless and prosper everything I am doing. I multiply every activity I accept and expect happiness and complete success. Realizing that I am one with all people, I affirm that there is a silent power flowing through me and them, which blesses and heals and prospers, makes happy and glad their pathway. Realizing that the whole world is made up of people like myself, I bless the world and I affirm it shall come under divine government of good under the divine providence of love, under the divine leadership of supreme intelligence. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So your assignment this week is to really embrace that truth. If you don't have a copy of the Living the Science of Mind and would like a copy of this meditation, please um, let me know or email info at cslminneapolis.org and we will get you a copy of it. Because this is the year, right? This is the year to suit up and to show up and to let that light shine so bright that we're going to need shades no matter what. Happy 2024. Mm -hmm.